everybody. Welcome to the Underwater Photography Show. As always, I'm Matthew Sullivan. And I'm Alex Mustard. And Alex, you just got back from, I think, two weeks um, diving at uh, Masool, and you were wearing their shirt today. Yes, yeah, proudly wearing the shirt. <laughs> Actually, I uh, didn't wore just what's clean in the wardrobe, maybe, determining what's, uh, what's on. But yeah, appropriate t-shirt for the episode. And yeah, I think, so, yeah. Really interesting to talk about, just because I think it's a it's a fascin- fantastic destination. Yeah, Raja Ampat is widely sort of hailed as being the best sort of reef tropical diving that you can do for for fish, for beauty, the combination of all that with a mixture of big animals as well. I think what makes Raja Ampat really exciting as a destination is it's not a small destination. There's a lot of it. And within Raja Ampat, there's a whole host of different diving experiences to have. That makes it a fantastic destination. And it's, I, you know, have been going to Raja Ampat for 20 years. And I look forward to going back every time. In fact, the two dive trips I've done this year have both been to Raja Ampat. So, and I, and you can do that because every trip there is really very different. Because there are, there's so much diving over such a large area. You can go resort based and focus on a relatively small area, but or you can go liverpool based and see a much wider area. On the liverpool, you you might think you're getting more because the different areas have very different diving. But what you find is when you go resort based is actually the resort has a whole host of dive sites that the liverboards that visit the area don't go to, and that provides an incredible amount of dive, diversity for diving. And particularly one of the things I love about Missoula Resort is they've got a phenomenal house reef for diving which being able to house reef dive you know just grab a tank and jump in the water and dive at your own pace and the way you want to with that quality of diving is you know just amazing you know on the house reef at Masul they've got their own jetty so you've got all the jetty covered in sea fans and soft coral we had big schools of bait fish around the jetty they've got massive resident schools of, of fusiliers that come down the reef they've got giant groupers that live on the, the house reef they've got um you know this black tip reef shop you know very healthy population of those to shoot um the lagoon on the back side of the of the this house reef is very popular with young turtles to come and young green turtles to come in and feed so anytime you want to change you can go and just shoot turtles um you swim up the house reef and it becomes goes from being sort of a hard coral garden up to being a um a wall dive with you know all the sea fans you could ever want to shoot on it we had again their big bait fish action on the house reef um several times we have mobulars coming in and hitting the bait fish schools or this is just on the house reef you know this is not when you go on the boat and go to the famous dive sites this is what the house reef stops and you you know hawksbill turtles and then loads of macro as well um you know on one of the workshops i ran in missoul the house reef was just packed with pygmy seahorses and we were able to shoot you know those there as well and you know there's just everything you could want this time it was really loads of nudibranchs there um, and so you've got great wide angle, great macro. The house reef also, because you've got this lovely hard coral up against the island, you can do your split level shooting there. And because it's on the house reef, you can wait until the tide is right, the sky is right, and shoot split levels in the optimum conditions. You know, you generally want to shoot at a, a relatively low tide so that the corals themselves become very close to the surface. So you can work them into the shot. And you obviously want blue sky with white fluffy clouds as a backdrop rather than gray skies or or whatever else might be around as a backdrop for those shots so you wait and you know okay the sun's going to be there at this time of day so i'm looking that way for my background okay the background looks good i know it's going to be low tide at this time okay yeah today and tomorrow these are the days to go and do it um and also with the jetty you know you've got the sunbeams coming through it which are best in the middle of the day often for sort of spearing down through the holes in the jetty so again what we quite often do is after the second dive of the day, you save a little bit of gas in your tank and then you jump in and do like a 15 minute dive as the boat pulls back to the dock, just when the sun is right under the jetty. And, you know, all of that is not possible on liverboard. And yeah. that's so that's something you really love about it. Plus the fact that Missoula Resort has, you know, knows all the dive sites inside out. They schedule the dives you know, to be, to hit all the sites at the optimum times of to tide and light and action. And they've got a whole host of, of sites that the liverboards don't dive on. And in fact, even, you know, it goes so far, even though, you know, liverboards very rarely would ever, 
you know, visit the island, even the cruise directors would very rarely visit the island. The dive shite map in the camera room at Missoul, which is not exactly like a place that gets a lot of visitors apart from people staying at the resort. They still, they don't mark all their dive sites on their map. They list them, but then actually when you look for where the actual point is on the map, they don't mark them on the map because they, they, they you know, they're, they're quite protective over some of the sites. So, um, yeah, I, it's really, you know, really just a fantastic place. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm going to bab babble on about it, so you should probably ask me more specific questions. Well, so the first thing I wanted to ask, because you touched on it, is you said you've been going to Raja for 20 years, and I imagine there's not many places in the world that look better or similar to how they did 20 years ago. So does Raja still um, look similar? Yeah, I would say that um, a sad part of it is when we first went to Raja Ampat, you would see almost no human activity anywhere. And now I would say that most you know, lots of islands and lots of the, the, the sort of more medium-sized islands have now got much more permanent sort of homestays, little houses, little fishermen bits. People have made things on them. You know, they you know, there's a, a beach with a couple of cabanas here and there, which it's still, you don't notice it. You'd still say it was completely free of humans if you'd never been there 20 years ago. But that change, I think, is a bit sad to see humanity creeping into Raja Ampat yeah. in places it wasn't 20 years ago. But overall, particularly in Missoul, um, and for those that don't know Raja Ampat, Raja Ampat is named the Four Kings after four big islands that dominate um, the, the, the geography in, in the area around the Bird's Head Peninsula at the western end of, of, of the island of New Guinea. And the western end of, of the island of New Guinea is known as West Papua, and it's a province of Indonesia. Um, and the four kings that make up Raja um, King and Ampat Four um, are, are the islands around that. There's actually more than four islands, but it's named after the four islands. And one of those islands is Missoul. And Missoul is a, a you know um, a reasonably sort of big island. I, I don't know how big it is at all, but I would say it's probably. 10 to 20 miles across and it's quite a circular island oh. now Missoul is not where the diving is and everyone sort of knows the area as Missoul Missoul is the big island off the big island there are a thousand small islands and rocks in in chains across the sea um, which is where the diving is and Missoul the resort is on an island right at the very end of those islands called um, Bat Batim um, island, which is next to um, Warakaraket, one of the islands, and it's near, it's just south of um, very famous dive sites like Nudie Rock, which is a, is a big, um, iconic, um, very recognisable area um, near to Fiabarchet, um and the um, Boo Island chain is kind of, it's, so it's kind of the bottom islands in this group of islands coming off the main island of Missoul. So although we call the area Missoul, Missoul is actually very specifically an island and a big island that we never dive anywhere near really we actually dive on the archipelago of islands that come off Missoul and call the area Missoul even though the individual islands all have names so sorry if that sounds a little bit confusing but hopefully it makes some sense maybe I'll drop a map into this this discussion to, to help the to, to help the casual viewers um, that said the area around the resort literally you know within the area you can see you have 20 or 30 truly world-class dive sites, um, which are right back, you know, bang slap next to each other. And that's the attraction of going there. You, these dive sites are dominated particularly by soft coral and sea fan scenery. So it's a very colourful underwater environment. But because the, the waters there are very rich as well, it's very, very fishy. So Missoul, I would say, is characterised by that. And the big change that I've seen over 20 years is that 20 years or 18 years ago, Missoul instigated their foundation, the resort instigated their foundation and properly protected. I think it's um, 300 um, um, square kilometres. It might be 300. I, I can't remember the amount. I might see if I can look it up anywhere. Yeah, they, they, anyway, they, they protected a large chunk of the ocean around there and didn't just say this is a park. They actually employ a team of rangers that keep the fishing boats out, that they interact and pay the local community to not fish in this area. And um, as a result, the biomass there has just boomed. And when, we when I first went down to that area, which was in 2006, 
Um, we didn't see a shark on that trip and we didn't see a manta either. And those things would be laughable these days. Those animals have rebounded really, really successfully because of that. It's also definitely more fishy now. It's crazy fishy in places. And particularly when you, you know, you hit certain dives at certain times of, of day or tide, when the fish are all just thronged on either one side of the reef or they're really close into the reef. And, you know, you do feel that there are more fish than water and it's just craziness underwater when it's like that. Um, the area obviously attracts big animals. And, and one of the things that I love in the area are the mantas. Um, and they have a big population of reef mantas that are loyal to the area and also oceanic mantas coming in and being cleaned. And although the, the dive site Magic Mountain is famous amongst the liverboards for them, there are five or six regular manta cleaning stations in the area that are just as good for manta action. And in fact, one of the weird things about our trip now is that we've just been there in m March. And in March, you kind of, ex or late March, you'd expect there not to be many mantas around, but there were tons around during our trip, which was fun. What is the normal, when do you normally expect to see mantas there? I, 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 if you'd asked me that 10 years ago, I'd say before Christmas. And then about five years ago, I'd kind of start saying, well, kind of, you know, either a couple of months before, a couple of months after Christmas. And then, yeah, this year, you know, even later than that, I don't know whether it's, you know, related to our Nino, whether it's just as the mantis population is building, they're hanging around longer. There's just more of them to be around. I'm not sure whether what the factor is in that. But usually Roger Ampat and, and Missoul has a really sort of clear seasonality in my mind in that the diving sort of kicks off there in the in the fall. Um, for good seasons but the early part of the fall the water's quite green and it's very rich there's millions of bait fish everywhere feeding on all the green rich plankton that's been stirred up by the stormier weather through a northern hemisphere summer um, and you get this big bloom of plankton you get this big bloom of bait fish that follows it and the reefs can be absolutely plastered in bait fish you know on top of them being covered in sea fans and groupers and all the normal reefs. Yeah. And then that bait fish population kind of gets eaten down and they eat down the greenness in the water. And basically, as the season goes on, you get clearer and clearer water, but less and less action. And as the water clears, so the mantas go elsewhere and that sort of thing. And usually by kind of January, end of January into February, you're kind of the bait fish are beginning to tail right off, but the visibility is improving. And so the challenge you have as a photographer is do you chase visibility or do you chase action? And I often go before Christmas because I think you get much more action, but you might have dodgy viz. If I want a bit better viz, I usually go after Christmas and accept I might not hit the very peak of the bazillion bait fish, but I will get more reliable viz. And we did this trip in March because I thought, right, I'm going to go right towards the end of the season and get the best viz I've ever had there. But except that maybe we won't get many mantas, we won't get many bait fish. And what was unusual about this last trip was that actually when we got there, we found that we had amazing visibility and it was the best visibility I ever had in the area. We had great weather as well. So it was, we had, you know, most days were very sunny. Um, but we also had tons of bait fish on certain sites, particularly on the house reef, which was great. And we also had tons of mantas. And the last two didn't really make sense to me because normally by the time the visitors got good, they've gone away. So it was kind of an absolute perfect trip from that point of view, but not through planning and probably just through to the fact that everything's always a bit weird in our Nino years. But maybe it's also a, a you know, reflection of that as manta populations are improving there or increasing, um, and they really are increasing there, um, that actually now there's just, there's more mantas, so they're around for longer. You know, they, they, they tell. And what was unusual on this trip as well with the mantas is that we were seeing mantas coming in to be cleaned, not just on the one or two dive sites that are famous as manta cleaning stations, but on just about every dive site we were seeing mantas, which was kind of really crazy. And seeing them coming in and being cleaned on all sorts of bits of the reefs that, for me, had never been traditional cleaning stations. But, you know, you'd just go, oh, this dive site's great because it's got the most amazing reef scenery. And, oh, and by the way, we managed to get a couple of mantas as well. So, yeah, it was really, really, really awesome trip. It's, it's pretty cool to hear about how, because most, the vast majority of wildlife or environment stories you hear these days are about places that are being heavily degraded or they don't look anything like they did 5, 10, 20 years ago. So it's cool to hear about if a place is protected and kind of left to its own devices with protection, that it can flourish and be better than it was 
how yeah. many years ago. Yeah. And it, it is rare in that regard. I think yeah. the secret to it is not everyone you know involved in marine conservation knows what you have to do. The difficulty is actually making what you have to do happen. Yeah. Um, and that means really basically putting the funding in place, which is what the Missoula Foundation has done so brilliantly, is you know every guest who goes and stays in the resort um, contributes you know significantly to that foundation. They obviously get donations as well. A lot of the liverboards in the area do donate to the foundation too. Um, it's a voluntary thing, so they don't all do it. Um, but it's well worth inquiring whether your liverboard does, because um, the dive sites in Missoula are dished out on a, you know, when you arrive in the area on a liverboard, you you ring the resort up at a certain time of day and book your dive sites for the next day. And I would suspect that if you're a liverboard that's contributing to the foundation, then probably you're getting, you know, yeah. oh yes, yes, you can have those ones. Um, whereas if you're maybe one of the liverboards who are are not contributing. But not all the liverboards go down there because it does cost a lot of fuel to go all the way down to Missoula. So there's plenty of liverboards you'll get on in Rajarampa. You know, people always go, oh, why, you know, this liverboard's more expensive than that one. What do you get? You know, you're getting the same diving. Well, sometimes you're not because, you know, lots of liverboards will go, oh, yeah, we heard the visibility's not very good in Missoula this week, so we're not going down there. Um, and, you know, nothing to do with the fact it costs them a lot of money and fuel to go down there. Um, so, you know, I, you know, you, there's an element of you do get what you pay for in these things, but anyway, um, it is a tremendous success story. I got myself sidetracked there, but I think what it is, it's the energy of particularly Andrew Marritt, the founders of Missoula, but the whole team there that have properly gone out and they never knows what you have to do. You probably, you know, stop the impacts on the environment and, oh, wow, the environment recovers. But yeah. what so often happens is it, it's just there's too much, too many people involved to make everything stop. But they engage with the local community. They got proper buy-in from the community. They retrained people and gave jobs to people who were traditionally shark fishermen and made them park enforcement officers. They've you know, got, you know, a, you know, kind of a police presence on their enforcement boats as well, which means they can properly, they've got, you know, proper teeth when they do catch people fishing and they can do you know they can properly prosecute them and you just then let nature take its course they also have you know you know there's there's you know some real rewilding efforts in the area that were also making a difference the island that the resort was built on was also used as a shark finning camp and the shark fishermen if they wanted to get some extra food they would bomb use you know dynamite to bomb the reefs to get to catch fish because it was the easiest way to catch fish and so on missoul they've done a lot of stay on the actual island resort they've done a lot of seabed stabilization over the last five ten years to allow coral to regrow and as most of the guests don't even realize it's it's all seeded coral because the coral there just grows so ridiculously fast there's um just by the dock actually there's some coral um propagation um grids just to provide stabilization on the sediment and the acropora is you know two three feet thick on top of it and it's only about three four years old and you go down they go wow it's just fields of this acropora and it's actually all planted on metal you know it's just all just attached and grown off of metal grids um yeah, it's also yeah. now yeah the the leopard shark um re um rewilding project the re-shark project there where they're Leopard sharks are quite common in public aquariums and they breed quite happily and lay eggs in public aquariums. The, this is the Indo-Pacific leopard shark, so not the Californian one. Um, the, it's also called a zebra shark, but most divers call it leopard shark. It's only got zebra stripes for the first sort of, sort of eight weeks of its life. Um, I now know from watching the babies grow. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, the, when they're born, they've got stripes. When they grow up, they've got spots. So they're called leopard sharks. And um, they're getting these eggs from the public aquariums, um, getting them shipped out to places around Rajarampa, and including Masool, and then letting those eggs hatch and then growing the babies on so they're a reasonable size to be released into the wild and then releasing them into the wild. So, Did you get to see any while you were there? Yeah, so they had... Um, I didn't see any leopard sharks in the sea, but I saw the incubation tanks that they were keeping them in. And what was incredible was how fast they were growing. And the public aquariums that obviously were previously were hatching the babies and growing them, they couldn't believe the growth rates that they were getting in Missoula, just in these... No, they're just in, you know, bathtubs, what they basically... Um, but pumped with lovely clean water from the reef. And the baby sharks there are growing ridiculously amounts. I mean, they're growing like this much a week. 
um, oh. crazy. <laughs> like, I was like, how old are these? Like expecting them to be like, oh yeah, six months or like two weeks. And these ones, oh, those are seven weeks old. And they're like three times, <laughs> it was crazy. So really, really interesting to, to see that. I, I just find the Risha Art Project really fascinating because I think if you'd ask someone in the, say, the late 70s, you know, would humans ever want to put more sharks into the ocean? Everyone would immediately say no. And it's great to see how that whole thing has turned around and this project has been so enthusiastically supported. I mean, it's not going to transform the reefs. You know, the leopard sharks are an important species, but you're not going to, you know, they're not keystone species. But yeah, I, I think the final thing I want to talk about, and I've, um, you can see my enthusiasm for the destination by the fact that I'm not shutting up, yeah. is that I, I think Missile Resort is just an incredible place to stay. I think it's, you know, for me, it's the most amazing dive resort that I've ever been to. In terms of, you know, it's a beautiful resort. Um, it's in a very remote, very special location with, you know, incredible diving available from it. I can't think of a resort that has better diving from the resort um, than, than there. Um, and the resort sort of lives up to that. You know, they it's a very well-developed and very sensibly developed resort. It's, you know, if you want to eat, you know, a you know, a T-bone steak with a, a tail of lobster every dinner, it's not the resort for you. It's much more of a ecologically managed resort. So they, you know, they think about how they're sourcing everything in the resort. So they ask you not to bring your own toiletries because they've, you know, sourced, you know, biodegradable soaps and things for you to use. And and the same with the the menu there. It's, you know, there's a lot of very, very tastily prepared plant based meals. And, you know, you can, you know, have a burger every night if you really want to, but they're kind of encouraging you to you know, to, to have locally sourced ingredients and locally sourced food just prepared by very, very good chefs. Um, but if, you, if you're someone who's like, I must eat, a, you know, a T-bone every night, it's probably not the resort for you. Um, but the whole experience of going there, you know, I think they have four or five staff to every guest. It's a small group of guests that are there. And you arrive all as one as a group of guests. So we, I, I was running this workshop with Erin Quigley and we were... We, you know, had the whole resort to ourselves because we find that works best there at that particular resort. Um, but the group doesn't dive together. We're split across four or five or six boats at different times. And some people are house reef diving. So you're out diving in little groups. And, and that's actually from a diving point of view. One of the things I'd say about the resort over the liverboards is not only do you get to dive the best, these amazing sites in that area multiple times, but you also get to dive them in very small groups which on a liverboard you don't because the whole liverboard yeah. is is diving that site for that hour. Whereas you go in the resort, you might only be four of you on the boat and there's four of you diving that site for an hour, which is a, is a really great experience. But yeah, I think for me, it's, you know, it's, it's heaven on diving earth and I can't, and if there is a better dive resort, you know, that's really focused on diving. You know, there's some very beautiful resorts, for example, in the Maldives where you can stay and they're amazing resorts and you can go diving there. But not everyone who goes to the resort by any stretch is thinking of diving when you go to those amazing resorts. I would say if you want to go to a resort that is focused fully on amazing diving, there's not a final one in the world. And it should be, you know, it's very expensive, but it's also booked out for forever because once people have tried it, they just know they, if they can afford it, they want to keep going back there. Did you get to see anything there this time that you either hadn't seen before or that really stood out? Like a one subject or one particular, some sort of action that you got to see? Oh, I'm just trying to think. Um, I think for me, the, you know, the unseason, having the visibility was what really amazed me. I dived, you know, I've dived a lot of those sites a lot of times. And there were certain sites where I'm like, oh, I never realized you could see that other dive site from this site when the visibility is like, like this good. You know, you could see out to, you know, oh, there's a whole, you know, I know that if you swim down the reef here, you can find another reef. But some, you know, here you could really see across to that. Um, and then just having the mantas coming in on so many sites that I'd never considered were even a manta cleaning station. And, you know, I, you know we go and dive this particular site because it's the most amazing dive site. And then, you know, we, um, but then you go down there and there's, you know, two oceanic mantas coming in and being cleaned. You're like, oh, wow. You know, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, it was an amazing trip. And I'm very sad because it's 2027 till I've next got a reservation to take a group there. And that's a long time. <laughs> well, at least you have something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, 
But uh, yeah, I'm per- selfishly, personally looking forward to seeing all your pictures from there whenever you get some ready to show, um, which I know is going to be a while because you probably have a lot of trips to, to get to. But um, if there's nothing else to add, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up. I'm sure you could talk about Masool for another several hours. But yeah, uh, for, uh, for this one, I think it's a good place to wrap up. And thank you guys for watching and we will see you next time.